Kim very kindly tells me my head is cut off. That's probably a good thing, Kim. <laughs> Hello and welcome uh, this afternoon to our latest uh, furlough scheme update. Um, today we'll be talking about flexible furlough, um, which actually started on the 1st of July. Um, uh, the, the, obviously furlough has been around for quite a while now, but we've got some uh, Mark II versions of furlough starting on the 1st of July. Um, where are we? Well, uh, uh, furlough obviously started in March, um, and up until June, um, we had the, uh, the first stage of the furlough scheme, which we called support for business. Um, that stage uh, allowed businesses to close down and claim furlough for anyone not working. Uh, we're now in the second stage, which we, uh, which the government are, are describing as back to work support. These new rules start from the 1st of July and they're intended to go on until uh, the furloughed um, support ends on 31st of October. Um, I put a question mark there about ending 31st of October because we're not certain that's going to be the, the date that everything stops. But at the moment, we've got to assume it is. Um, I'll just do a quick resume on where we were with the old furlough scheme. Um, obviously, it started in March, ran to June. Um, I think you all know that 80% uh, of gross pay plus national insurance plus pension up to a maximum of £2,500 a month could be reclaimed uh, for any of your staff that weren't working, that were on furlough. Uh, now, the first stage was an all or nothing scheme. You were either on furlough or you were working. There was nothing in between. Um, and obviously that caused a problem bringing people back to, back to work because there was a need for uh, businesses and small businesses in particular to bring people back to work on a, on a part-time basis. Uh, those amendments were thought about by the government and um, they encouraged back to work. So from the 1st of July 2020, uh, the scheme is going to be extended to make it more flexible uh, to enable employers to bring previously uh, furloughed employees back to part-time work and still receive a grant for the time that they're not working. Uh, the key thing here to remember is that we're no longer going to be in an all or nothing position. So you can be furloughed and you can work from the 1st of July. Um, but the only people that can be furloughed are employees who have previously been furloughed under furlough Mark 1 scheme. So it's only employees that have been furloughed before 30th of June. And in fact, they have to be uh, furloughed for at least three weeks before the 30th of June. Um, it's only those uh, employees that can be on part-time furlough after the 1st of July. So we're only talking about people you've already furloughed. Um, how do you put someone on flexible furlough? Um, well, at the moment, most of you will have uh, a, a furlough agreement with uh, your employee, um, a written agreement saying that you've put them on furlough, and at some stage you expect that furlough to, to end. Um, what's needed now is an amendment to that furlough agreement, um, a flexible furlough agreement. Uh, this flexible furlough agreement will uh, outline uh, when you're expecting to put people uh, to work and when you're expecting them to stay on furlough. Uh, the, the agreement is going to have to separate those two things out. Um, You'll need to work with your employees to uh, get them to understand what you're trying to do. And you'll need to have a written agreement between you and the employee to um, document what you're trying to do. So what we're saying here as employers, what should you be doing? You should be discussing with your employees um, uh, who wish to be placed on flexible furlough outlining which hours they're expecting to work. And as I run through this, you'll realize hours becomes the key thing in all of this. Um, the staff will need to agree on the arrangements uh, for their part-time work. Um, 
obviously this might be difficult, but it's a good idea to get this communication going very, very early on. So what we need is an agreement um, to be confirmed in writing. And uh, in fact, um, I've said it needs to be kept for a minimum of six years now. I'm only saying six years through most of the documentation we've seen from HMRC to date. Uh, you've had to keep all this documentation for five years, uh, but on the latest flexible furlough um, uh, guidance, they've mentioned six years. So I think um, we're going to need to keep all this uh, stuff in a box for one more year than we thought in the first place. Uh, that could just be a mistake on the furlough guidance, as you'll see as we go on, there are a few mistakes in there. And now we have a written agreement uh, that you might want to use for your flexible furlough arrangement. Um, bearing in mind, this is uh, prepared by us. We're not lawyers, we're not HR consultants. Uh, we've done this um, out of common sense rather than uh, with any legal um, background. Um, you could use our um, flexible furlough agreement. Um, alternatively, um, what we have found since we produced our own is on the ACAS site, um, there are four uh, templates uh, that are pretty easy to use and pretty easy to amend. Um, and so um, I think, although we've sent on our agreement to a number of people, uh, the ACAS agreements are probably uh, better um, and um, available free on ACAS site. Um, the, uh, the address for that ACAS site and the furlough letter templates uh, is on this presentation here. Um, I wonder, Joe, could you just put that address in the chat if anyone wants it? Um, it's pretty easy to find. If you go to Google, search ACAS and search furlough letter templates, uh, it'll come up straight away. Uh, they have four furlough letter templates there. Uh, first one's the furlough agreement up until March 2020, which most of you or you all have. Uh, the second one is an extension to that furlough agreement. Um, so if you, in your first furlough agreement, said it ran for six weeks and you're beyond that, you need an extension letter, that's there. Third one is a flexible furlough agreement, what we're talking about now. Um, and then finally, there's an agreement to end furlough. Uh, which again um, is, is needed and I'll run through that in a little, what, little while. So I think those four ACAS templates are, um, are particularly good and you should have a look at those if, you're not, if you haven't got something else. Okay, how long must flexible furlough last? Um, well, if you remember previously, um, you had to be on furlough for three weeks to benefit from the scheme or your employees had to be on furlough for three weeks to benefit from the scheme. And the flexible furlough, uh, it doesn't matter how long it is. It can be any amount of time. Um, so we're talking of the, um, the furlough period, maybe on a Monday, you go back to work on a Tuesday and Wednesday, maybe a furlough on a Friday. Um, it can be any amount of time. We don't have to have these agreements running for three weeks. Um, saying that um, claims must be for a minimum of seven calendar days. Um, and um, employees can enter into flexible furlough agreements more than once. So you could set up a flexible furlough agreement for the next seven days, um, and then you could change it uh, in seven days time to um, take into account that your, your shop or your cafe is, has got more busy or less busy, and you need to change the way that furlough agreement works. Um, but we have to bear in mind that there are, these are two separate furlough schemes um, and uh, they run completely separately. Furlough Mark 1, all or nothing furlough, um, that runs to the 30th of June. We have to do claims to the 30th of June and then we have to start a, a second claim on the 1st of July. Um, now, none of this particularly matters to you if we're doing the furlough claims for you, but I'm just explaining it in case anyone does their own furlough claims. Uh, if you do, you're going to have to uh, run a claim to 30th of June, no matter when your claim period is, and then start another claim from the 1st of July. And those new claims must be for at least seven calendar days long. Um, and they've got to start and end in the same month. Um, it's got an awful lot more difficult with furlough as it goes forwards. And you'll see there's a lot more rules to be, uh, to be complied with to get these claims in. 
Uh, from our point of view, we propose uh, carrying on doing these furlough claims on a monthly basis. Um, it is possible to do them on a weekly basis now, um, but we need to ease the administration. They take an awful long time to get processed. Um, there isn't a quick and easy way to do them. Um, so we need to really keep them going on a monthly basis if we're doing them for you at the moment. Okay, um, I'm going to just um, go through a few examples of pay periods. This doesn't really matter if we're, if we're doing them for you, um, then um, uh, you don't really need to worry about pay periods. You just need to tell us when you when, uh, uh, want to pay people and when you want your claims to go in. Um, I've set out um, an example of pay periods spanning June and July there. I won't even bother to run through the, um, the, uh, the wording there. All these slides are available if you want them. Um, so you can look at this at your leisure in the future. Um, if, you, if you want it, all the slides, again, put a note in the chat for Tom or Joe, and they will then send you on a copy of all the slides. Um, but, and you can look at your leisure at how you uh, 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 split pay periods between June and July. Um, similarly, if you want to look at how you're going to split pay, pay periods between July and August, uh, there's an example there. It's, it's pretty straightforward in that you can only have a pay period that starts and ends in the same month. So when we have a, a four week pay period running from the 20th of July to the 16th of August, we have to have two claims. One runs from the 20th of July to the 31st of August, and the second one runs from the 1st of August to the 16th of August. Uh, again, if we're doing the claims for you, don't worry about that. If you're doing them yourself, just be aware that you've got to separate out these claims. Um, now, how much can I claim for? Um, right, there's a number of things that are happening here. First of all, the cap is coming down. Um, if you remember, the most you can claim for any employee uh, is £2,500 a month. Um, now, uh, that cap is going to come down as the government start to withdraw funding from furlough. So the cap in July is £2,500 plus national insurance plus pension. Um, in August, that cap comes down to £2,500, but no claim for national insurance and no claim for pension. In September, um, the funding starts to get withdrawn. So the maximum you can claim for any employee is £2,187.50, and you can't claim for pension or national insurance. And in October, that cap comes down to £1,875 and no claim for national insurance or pension. So the scheme allows for employers to recover uh, the remainder of wages up to that maximum cap. Um, and the wages caps are proportional to the hours an employee is furloughed. For example, if you are um, entitled to 60% of the £2,500 cap, um, if you're on furlough for 60% of your usual hours. Um, I'll, I'll go through some examples in a minute, um, but you just have to have the principle that you, if you've got someone that is uh, partly furloughed and partly working, you probably won't get that £2,500 as a maximum. You'll only get the proportion. Um, these, and as I say, this will start to reduce as we go through uh, August, September and October. What records should you keep? Now, records are going to get an awful lot more complicated as we go forwards. Uh, to date, um, you've had to keep your furlough agreements, uh, you've had to keep a record to show that your employees weren't working for you. Uh, you've had to know uh, your, your previous year's uh, pay for these employees, both the average and the corresponding period last year. Um, but going forwards, there's an awful lot more that needs to be kept. Employers now need to keep records of how many hours their employees work and the number of hours they're furloughed during flexible furlough. So it's going to be very important everywhere through the guidance uh, in terms of flexible furlough, there's a need for em employers to know uh, what their employees' usual hours are, how many hours they're working and how many hours they're furloughed. Um, and that and those hours are the only way that you can actually make a furlough claim. You've got to know the 
uh, the hours that you're expecting to work and the hours that you actually are working. When I talk about expecting to work, HMRC set out the rules as to what your usual hours are. Um, it, it's uh, it's um, apparent that uh, you need to record down your working week uh, for every employee if you're going to make a claim. Uh, you need to know what their, uh, their usual working hours are and you need to know what hours they actually worked. So flexible furlough is very much for employees that are paid by the hour or by the day or, or a fixed rate for a number of hours work a week or a month. Um, if you haven't got that, then it doesn't look likely that you're going to actually be able to claim on flexible furlough. Um, it's, um, as, I've, uh, as I said there, it's not much good for a, a salesman or commission-based um, person unless you can get the hours worked or not worked rec uh, recorded. So if it's a matter that, you know, you could be working any time um, and you can't record down when you are working and when you're not working, it's not likely that you're going to be able to put in a flexible furlough claim at the moment. Um, HMRC are insistent on you knowing the hours that people work and the hours that they're expected to work. So uh, info now required for furlough claims. Um, up to now, uh, we've needed to know um, the usual wages, either fixed or variable. We needed to know last year's average wages, what was on the P60 last year. And we needed to know the uh, wages in the corresponding period last year. So for example, if we were trying to do a furlough claim for uh, April 2020, we also needed to know the April 19 wages um, if your employees got paid variable amounts. And that's all we needed up until June to be able to do these claims. Uh, we just needed wage details really. Going forward from the 1st of July, we need a lot more information. We need to know what the usual hours are. And it's easy to say usual hours. I'll explain in a minute how difficult it is to work it out. Uh, we need to know what last year's average hours were. So we're now looking at the year to the 5th of April, 2020. Um, we know the pay, but do we know the average hours that these employees worked? We need to know that figure. Um, we need to know the hours worked in the corresponding period last year. So if we're now doing a flexible furlough claim for someone that's on variable pay, um, I don't know, someone working in a pub and you work some shifts and not others, um, we need to know um, how many hours they worked this year. We need to know what their usual hours are. And we also need to know what their actual hours were for the same period last year. Um, so a further bit of information we need to get hold of, which may not be in your records at the moment, but we need to find, get this, if we're gonna be able to put in flexible furlough claims. Um, and we also obviously need to know the actual hours worked. Okay, now onto some of the calculations. Um, I'll start to bore you a bit with some of these calculations. How do I calculate working hours? Um, well, there's two different calculations uh, employers can use um, to work out their employees' usual hours, uh, depending on whether they're fixed or variable hours. So if they're fixed hours, where the employee works hours that are always fixed and their pay doesn't vary with the number of hours they work, uh, then the reference period is the uh, last pay period ended before the 19th of March, 2020. So if you've got someone that's working for you and they always work 37 hours a week, uh, we look at February, 2020, uh, was it 37 hours a week then? If it was, uh, we know the fixed hours. Um, if it would vary, depending on how many shifts they came into, then we have to go on to variable hours. So fixed hours, relatively straightforward. If we look at February 2020, if they're fixed, that's the figure we use. Uh, variable hours gets a lot more complicated. Uh, where an employee works variable hours, the employer will use the higher of the average number of hours worked in the tax year 1920. So we now have to calculate between the 6th of April 19 and the 5th of April 20, how many hours uh, your employee worked? 
um, and uh, that might be possible from your pay slips um, because it might say hours and rates. Um, it might be that you've just kept uh, details of how much you're paying employees and you might have to go back and find other records to be able to work out the number of hours worked um, in the previous tax year. But that's a figure that's needed. Uh, you can't do flexible furlough claims without getting that figure. Um, so there's a need to get the average number of hours worked in the previous tax year. There's also a need to get the um, corresponding calendar period in the tax year 1920. So what I mean by that, as I said before, is if you're doing a furlough claim for uh, the month of July 2020, we need to know if someone's on variable pay, how many hours they worked in July 19. Um, and similarly, if it's weeks, we need to know how many hours they worked in the corresponding week. Um, when we talk about weeks, and, and um, there are uh, different dates that weekends that weeks end at, last year to this year, and there's an even more complicated calculation to get to the, the correct figure for, for usual wages if you've got variable pay. Um, but what we need, if we've got the information, if we've got the average number of hours, and we know the hours for each week or each month last year, then we can do the calculation. If we haven't got that information, we can't do that calculation. So that's what we need to get hold of, those variable hour, informa uh, variable hour information this year and last year. Um, okay, um, examples on how to work out usual hours for employees who are contracted for a fixed number of hours. Uh, this one is easy. Um, we've got someone that's just uh, uh, contracted 37 hours a week. Um, it's dead straightforward. They work across five, five working days. Um, this is one of HMRC's examples. Um, what are the usual hours? Well, I've highlighted them both in yellow there. They're 26. Um, uh, it depends when you work out usual hours and what your, your pay periods are and your claim periods are. So even when we have something as simple as an employee working 37 hours a week, across five days, our claim periods might end up with, with a different figure. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with all the calculations here. You can see them on the slides if you want, or you can have a look at HMRC's guidance, um, but there's a whole load of calculations to do in the background to work out what usual hours are for particular pay periods or for particular claim periods. Um, uh, further example, this one's on shift working. So this one just goes through if you're working uh, shifts. Uh, so if you're working 12 hour days with uh, different shifts, uh, it gives you the example of how to work out your usual hours. Um, it, uh, again, I'm not gonna run through all of these because it's not uh, relevant to any one of you listening, but you can all have a look at the examples if, you, if that's something you've got. Um, this one, I put a, a further example in here. Um, this one I've only really put in because um, it gives an example of usual hours when an employee uh, is contracted for a fixed number of hours and was off sick or family related statutory leave any time before 19th of March 2020. Under the old scheme, we did have a few employees that lost out when they were off uh, sick, when they were on variable pay, uh, they lost out on their furlough claims. Um, and this particular change to go into hours could help those employees um, have larger furlough claims going forwards. That's the only reason I've put that one there. It's that there are a few people that gain out of um, the changes that are, are happening. Um, okay, uh, we've then got um, how to work at the usual hours for the same period last year um, uh, when someone's on variable hours. Um, this is relatively straightforward. We're going to take the higher of the average hours worked in the tax year 1920 and the corresponding period of last year. So as I say, when we look at um, July's fur flexible furlough claim, we've got to look at the average number of hours uh, an employee worked if they were on variable hours uh, for the whole of last year to get that average for the period. Um, and also look at the, num the actual number of hours they worked in the corresponding period last year and choose the higher of the two. Um, up to date, we've only had to worry about their pay amounts, but now we're worrying about their pay amounts 
and the number of hours they've worked. Uh, example of how to work at your average number of hours worked in a taxi in 1920. Um, here's uh, HMRC's calculation. Um, it goes through five or six different steps. Um, uh, it always requires you to work to know how many hours have worked. Um, it's, it's vital we have that information. I know I've said it a few times, um, but the only way we can do these calculations is when we have the hourly information. And you know, if there's one thing that you need to take away from this, um, this uh, webinar today is if you haven't got those hours, go and look at your diaries, go and look and see if you can make, find the records to make up those hours if you wanna put in flexible furlough claims, because without them, we just can't do the calculations. Uh, another example, I don't know why I'm showing you these examples, but I'd really like to show you this example because I've taken this one straight out of um, HMRC's guide um, and I've only really taken it out for um, the reason that, you know, when we make a, an honest mistake in some of these furlough claims, which inevitably will have happened, um, there will be the occasional mistake because all of these furlough claims to date have had to be done by uh, individually by hand for all intents and purposes, picking up information from various places to do the calculations and uh, with the best will in the world, we try to get them all right, um, but there is, a, uh, you know, there is a likelihood that there will be a few wrong. Um, I'm very pleased to say that in uh, HMRC's guidance, um, this is 2.7 of their guidance, and um, if we look to the little bit um, at the bottom, um, they're, they're explaining how to work out usual hours based on hours worked, in uh, more than one pay period in 1920, uh, they uh, get to the conclusion, add them all together, eight plus 25 equals 336. Um, that's a whole number, so it doesn't need to be rounded up or down. Um, that's um, HMRC's guidance. Um, obviously, um, there's a type and error in there, um, but it made me feel a bit better to see that um, they can make errors like that as well as, as, well as we can. Um, is this all confusing on actual hours um, and, and usual hours? Of course it is. It's completely confusing. Um, ICAEW's tax uh, faculty um, has highlighted this confusion and actually given a really good example of um, how confusing it is and how upset perhaps some of your employees might be when you're working out usual hours. Um, they're taking the example of someone working uh, 35 hours a week, uh, paid on the last uh, working day. Um, now, if you take HMRC's method to calculate their usual hours, uh, you will take 31 days uh, times seven hours a day. We're talking about July here. So 31 days times seven hours a day. Uh, this person worked five working days, uh, effectively Monday to Friday. So we take 31 times seven times five sevenths. So five working days divided by seven calendar days. And according to HMRC, uh, you will work 155 hours in July. Um, if any of your employees check the number of hours they're gonna work in July, um, there are actually 23 working days in July, uh, Mondays to Fridays. Um, so they will work 161 hours. Um, HMRC are saying 155, your employees know they've worked 166. Uh, we have to use HMRC's calculations. So when we're using these calculations, we have to take 155 hours as the usual hours. Um, we might have a few upset employees in, in that um, if they can be um, bothered to check through all these calculations. But um, the calculations are confusing and they don't necessarily follow logic. Okay, I'm going to go to something a little bit more easy to follow. Uh, example of how to calculate the minimum furlough pay for an employee who is flexibly furloughed. Um, here we've got um, an employee who's been furloughed since May, um, paid uh, monthly from the 1st of July. Uh, the employee um, is going to work 80 hours. And we've calculated, for all those calculations I've spoken about before, we've calculated that the usual hours this employee are 164. Um, so we've got 84 furloughed hours, we've got 80 hours worked to make up our usual hours, 164. 
Usual wages are 2,250. Um, if we take 80% of the usual wages, um, we get to 1,800 pounds. Um, so then we take that 1,800 pounds, the 80% of the usual wages, uh, we uh, divide it by the usual hours, 164 usual hours, um, and that gives us a rate. It's uh, 10 pounds, uh, 97.56 uh, pounds per hour. Uh, we take that figure and we multiply it by the furloughed hours, the 84 pounds, uh, the 84 hours, and we come to a figure of furlough pay of £921.95. Um, and then, of course, we've got the working hours. So we've now got working hours, um, 80 of them, at, I'm assuming we're still on the same rates, £13.72, um, coming to £1,097.60, uh, giving their total pay £2,019.55. So um, that gives you an example of how we calculate their pay. Um, the maximum that could be taken in terms of furlough pay uh, is effectively uh, the uh, proportion of furloughed hours over total hours times two and a half thousand pounds. But we're within that in this particular case. Uh, so in this particular case, employee gets two thousand and nineteen pounds fifty five. Uh, gives you a relatively straightforward uh, calculation of how to calculate. Um, okay, um, then we're on to um, uh, September contributions by the company really here. So now we've got uh, an example of how to work out how much the minimum furlough pay you can claim for is. So we're now talking about a claim in September when the um, furlough payments start to go down. Um, so we've got an employee who's been uh, furloughed since April. Um, they've calculated the minimum furlough uh, pay for this period is £1,500, which is 80% 80, uh, 80 of the um, usual wages, which are £1,875 a month. Furlough pay could be £1,500. Um, but at this stage, um, we're only able to claim because we've moved into September, we're only able to claim from the government 70% uh, of furlough pay. Uh, the company's got to contribute 10% of furlough pay. So you've got this employee who used to be uh, paid £1,875. You're paying them 80% furlough pay, £1,500. Um, you can claim from the government uh, seven-eighths of that £1,500, £1,312.50, um, but you're going to have to contribute towards that employee's uh, pay £187.50 um, plus their national insurance and their pension. Um, if you bear that in mind, if you go forward to October, uh, the contribution on that employee will become £375 a month. And that's just giving you the examples on that. Um, what should you do in terms of all these, um, all these calculations? Well, um, at the moment, the, if you're doing it yourself, I can only say use HMRC's calculator. Um, it's slow, it's uh, getting more complex every time you use it. Um, you will have probably 100 entries to run through. Now we've got to put all these uh, wages and usual wages and usual hours and uh, last year's hours for corresponding periods. Um, there will be a lot more entries to do. Um, but if you use their calculator, uh, you get an answer that they've approved um, and um, that's the way to do it. Um, uh, if we do the claims for you, um, then there's a few things you can really help us with. Um, certainly, if you can have your hourly records for the actuals for now, and um, ideally what was going on last year, if we haven't already got those hourly records, we need to know what was happening last year. Um, we also need to have these records as early as possible in the, um, in the pay period. Um, obviously, as you can see, uh, what was a, um, I don't know, let's say a 10 part, a 10 question um, route to get an answer is now a 30 or 40 question route to get an answer. Um, and so certainly it's, it's going to take a lot longer to get these um, claims through and get them calculated correctly. Um, with the complexity of the um, calculation now. 
Um, in terms of that, um, as, as you, you will all know, we've we've kept the um, uh, all the furlough in free for all in, for all our clients uh, to date, um, and certainly we will try to do that for all our clients right through to the end of the furlough period. Um, what we're promising at this stage is if you've got three or less employees, um, we will keep doing it for free, um, assuming you're paying your accountancy fees, of course. Um, if you've got more than that, we might need to come back to you. We're going to experiment during July to see how long it's taking to do these calculations. But you know, if you've got 25 employees and um, we've got to go through these processes and they're taking an extortionate amount of time, then uh, we might need to come back to you and ask for a contribution towards it, um, which hopefully you'll find um, acceptable in the circumstances. Um, that's where we stand at the moment. Um, uh, what can, uh, another question I keep getting asked, what can we do when the government's uh, scheme ends? Um, well, I, I just want to highlight the, the things you can do when the scheme ends, or in fact, before the scheme ends, if you want to. So when the scheme ends on 31st of October, uh, you as the employer have got to decide to either bring your employees back to work on their normal hours, on their normal employment contract. Um, you could decide to reduce your employees' hours subject to employment rights and um, making sure you were doing all that correctly. Um, you could decide to terminate their employment. There is nothing to stop you terminating uh, their employment or putting them on notice of redundancy during the furlough period. Um, as far as we can see, there's nothing to stop that. And that's the uh, advice I see in general from HR consultants as we go forward. That you can start that redundancy process and put people on uh, notice of redundancy, uh, either during furlough or afterwards. I think if you're doing it during furlough and you're paying notice periods, you are subject to their employment rights. So I think that you... Um, end up having to pay 100% of wages, um, if that's what's in their employment contract. Um, but the one thing I would say, if you're looking at any of those things in terms of altering the employment rights or um, making people redundancy, redundant, um, go and get some HR advice. Um, if you've got your own HR consultants, fine. Um, if you haven't and you need a bit of help, um, if you have our uh, tax uh, investigation insurance, um, there's a free uh, employment and HR helpline included in, within that. And um, I think I'm going to ask um, Jo, who's probably got the number near her, um, I wonder if she could put that in the chat, uh, that number in case you haven't got it. Um, or otherwise, just remember, if you've got tax investigation insurance, you have got an employment and HR helpline um, that you can contact free. Um, and um, if you've got that, then contact us when you need to, and we'll give you that number or look on your paperwork for your uh, tax investigation insurance. The number will be on there. Um, I don't really think I need to run through these things with you. Uh, basically, this is just telling you from July, we've got part-time furloughing. Um, from August, uh, we've got uh, the loss of employers' national insurance and pension contributions from the furlough claim. From September, uh, we can only claim 70% of the 80% furlough wages, and we can't claim national insurance and pension. From October, we can only claim 60% of wages uh, uh, when, we're, when we're paying the uh, employee 80% of their wages as furlough payments. So we've got, to, uh, we've got to contribute 20% and we can't claim national insurance or pension. One other thing that comes up quite often, uh, if, if there is an error, if we've made an error, either there's an error in a calculation somewhere, or um, you have inadvertently told us that someone was on furlough when they weren't, um, then their uh, HMRC have told us how to deal with uh, with errors. Um, if there's an over, if if we've um, uh, result, if we've got an overpayment, um, you've got to pay this back to HMRC. Uh, this can be done on the next um, furlough claim. Um, so if we know we've over, we've overclaimed. 200 pounds on an old claim, uh, we can just adjust it on the next one um, and um, 
keep a record. We don't need to tell HMRC we've adjusted it. We just need to keep a record of why we've adjusted it. Um, that's for overpayments where we're putting in another claim. Um, if we uh, find an overpayment, um, uh, an overclaim, and um, we aren't going to send in any more claims, uh, then we have to tell HMRC and they will give us a payment reference number and the money will be paid back to HMRC. Um, if there's an underclaim, underpayment claim, so I don't know, we've forgotten to put someone in the claim who was on furlough or there was a calculation error that put an underclaim, underpayment, underpayment claim, uh, then we have to contact HMRC to amend the claim. Um, uh, as you're... As you're increasing your amount of claim, uh, HMRC say they need to conduct additional checks. Um, I think uh, what they've made it plain and obvious is that uh, they think that there are across the country a number of, um, of businesses that are putting in fraudulent uh, furlough claims. Either their employees are working and they're claiming furlough or they're making up figures uh, and putting in claims. Uh, the system um, allows for everyone to be paid within six days um, and so it can be open to abuse. HMRC have indicated that they're really going to crack down on abuse. Uh, they are going to go and do checks of these calculations so it's vital you keep all the calculations and all the paperwork and the furlough letters, the, uh, the adjustments to the furlough, the flexible furlough agreements, uh, the end of furlough agreement is vital you keep all of those for six years because they intend to check these things um, as we go forwards, they're going to need to collect a lot of tax. Um, so um, overpayment furlough claims could be an easy place for them to, to go. Um, so please keep all your records um, and keep them for six years.